Hello, everyone. My name is John Frashante. We're here with Spencer. He covers the Tampa Bay Rowdies for Total NASL and Deal, who covers the Adler Fury. How are you guys today? Doing good. Doing well. It's hot in Ottawa. Tiger, too. So uh, let's get talking about Freddie Adu. He joined Tampa Bay Rowdies. I know that's old news, but Spencer, uh, what is your thoughts on that signing? Um, I think it's a great signing. Um, he showed it on the pitch last uh, Saturday when he uh, assisted our only goal to Mike Santos. Uh, he came in about, I think it was like the 75th minute, so he played about 15 minutes. But as soon as he got on the field, there was a different feel. Um, and a lot of fans, there's been a lot of buzz around here and just uh, nation, uh, around the nation and everything just because we've been more on ESPN FC and all that. There's more talk about the Rowdies because of Freddie Adu. Um, you know, he's... Ever, there's people there chanting his name as soon as we're three minutes into the game, and not even the supporter section where I watch the game for most times in the mob. Um, people are starting chants, we want Freddie, and just yelling Freddie. As soon as he walks out on the pitch, you know, Freddie, Freddie, Freddie. So it's it's a, a lot of buzz down here in St. Pete about Freddie Adu. You said that you... Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> That's the time we have tonight, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that the Tampa Bay Rowdies have been on SportsCenter and on uh, ESPN, and one of those things was the helicopter going on the field, so that was a bit weird. Uh, yeah, well, the past, like, you know, about four or five days, we've had a way too much rain. I think I saw on the, they said it was equivalent of, like, five feet of snow in four days is how much rain we've had. We've had over, like, seven inches where I live of rain. So we've... Uh, the field on Saturday was so soaked that they couldn't get it dried in time, so they actually went and got a helicopter to come, and if you saw the video, it was just flying in patterns over the uh, field, and it was pushing the water off the field to help dry it up. <laughs> so let's go into Dio. Uh, the Fury have been playing great. What has been that, like, why have they been playing so great? Okay, well, I think it's been a process ever since we came into the league last year. Uh, thus, Marco Santos, the head coach of the Fury, has, has has had a plan. And at times it was hard to buy into the plan because it wasn't looking like what he was talking about. He preaches passing along, along the ground, uh, building up play, and not playing long ball at all. And at times it didn't look like that last year. It looked like long ball a lot. Um, and this year, if you look at the spring season, when the team started to build an identity, it was for defensive play. And we went on like this crazy run of 600 and some minutes scoreless, uh, nobody scoring on the Fury. And then, like I wrote uh, at the midway point, I said, if by some miracle the offense can get going with this great defense, look out, folks, because this is, this is the team. And sure enough, we come back from the break, and the goals start going in. Uh, and I think that we've got a tough stretch coming up. The, they go on the road this weekend to Edmonton. Well, actually, Fort McMurray, which we can talk about later if you want. It's kind of weird. And then we go to Indy on the road. Then three home games against Minnesota, New York, and Tampa. Not easy. Uh, I think it's Tampa. Not an easy schedule. Um, but, again, it's NASL. There really isn't any... There aren't any uh, easy games. Uh, I'm, I'm on a wait-and-see kind of thing. Like, they're playing really well, and it's never been this good in the year and a half that we've been in the league. Uh, hopefully it keeps on going. Do you believe that they can keep this up? Yeah, what you've got with Mark Dos Santos is not only is he a, a good tactician, uh, he's a master motivator. Uh, he, he did it with the impact when they were in Division Two, and he brought them uh, into the quarterfinals of the, the, champion, the CONCACAF Champions League. And when he was signed to Ottawa, everybody knew his name because of what the impact had done. And Montreal is two hours down the road, so we kind of followed them for, for a long while when we didn't have the team. Um, so I think they do have a chance to keep this going. Um, they, there's no reason why they wouldn't, really, because what you're seeing on the field is not a fluke. It's 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 a it's a plan, and the plan has uh, borne fruit. I saw on the Fury's website they uh, Mark Dos Santos he released a letter to the supporters saying that we appreciate the support and we uh, 
need to keep it going. So has this been a uh, process of building the club up? Yeah. Um, the letter, it's the second or third letter that he writes to the fans, which is, is cool. And uh, he's a really genuine guy. If you guys have ever seen a, a halftime interview with Mark Dos Santos or post-game comments, he doesn't sugarcoat anything. He tells you like it is. And at the same time, like this is a letter that he wrote to the fans, and you can see that it's coming from a place of feeling. But at the same time, it's it's a marketing ploy, right? We're trying to get more people into the stadium. Ottawa is a town of over a million people when you count uh, when you count the city that's right across the river, uh, Getsino, and we get five thousand people a game. We should be able to do more. As you saw during the Women's World Cup, the stadium was full uh, or near full for for all of the games, no matter who was playing. So there is the the potential for the sport to grow in Ottawa and to attract more fans, and I think that letter is part of that process. So uh, let's get to the first matchup, which is on Friday night, which uh, it's the first Friday night matchup that we see in the NESL. Do you guys like the Friday night match? Uh, Go ahead, Spencer. Um, personally, I think it's different. I mean, it'd be... It's... I think it's cool because um, it's a different thing to watch. I mean, the other sports, you know, across the world play games more than on, you know, one or two days a week, and it'd be interesting to see how it plans out and if more teams will do it. I mean, MLS, they play on Friday nights almost every week, and their supporters get excited and can't wait for Friday night soccer to come. But in this league, we have Wednesday night soccer, which it's okay, but Friday night soccer is something different and maybe something that we may have to get used to. So tomorrow night we can see Jacksonville or Armada taking on Minnesota United. Uh, that's going to be a great matchup. Armada, bottom of the fall season table, and Minnesota United in third place. So a fight there. Uh, the Armada have three points, and with a victory, with a three-point victory, they can uh, just go up the table. Uh, so... Yeah, John, if I can interject there about uh, Friday night games. Yeah. Uh, we had a Friday night game in Ottawa uh, in the spring season, and it's the best atmosphere that has ever been at uh, TD Place. Um, you get people who are coming straight to the stadium from work. It's Friday. They're happy. They're ready to party. It was amazing. And we have let the, the, the club know that we loved the night games and the Friday night game. Now, we have a problem in Ottawa where we run into traffic with the CFL team that uh, they play Friday night games often and they get uh, priority in the stadium but uh, for us uh, Friday night games are we, we, we take all Friday night games if we could. Let's go to the second matchup uh, on Saturday night at 7.30 p.m. we got Spencer's boys the Tampa Bay Rowdies taking on the Carolina Redhawks so can you talk about the Rowdies matchup against the Redhawks? Yeah, um, they need to they need to change something up. I mean, the past three games we've had zero points. Um, we have three points in this fall right now, bottom of the table. Um, we just need uh, something to change. We need to finish in the third against Carolina and against every team we play for the rest of the season. Uh, you know, we're our defense is what's kept us alive, even in these losses where they're one one nil or anything like that. We, our defense just keeps us in the game, and they need to finish. And with the new signings, we just actually got a. Omar Salgado on loan from uh, El Tigre, and he's a six foot four, uh, really big, big guy, um, and uh, he plays like a center forward, like the nine. So hopefully, I'm thinking they'll throw him in. And with Freddie, I mean that's all offense right there, really, with those two signings. So I'm hoping we can finally finish some goals in the third, and you know get some points back. Yeah. So uh, can we get your score prediction for that matchup? I'm hoping for a 2-1 Rowdies win. That's just personal preference, but that's what I can see. I think we can finally uh, put some goals away, and then we'll be okay. And then, Because uh, our defense will keep us in there, so we're fine. And let's get to the, uh, the Derby, the Canadian Derby matchup. Everyone loves the Derby, uh, and probably even the Canadians. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do like Derbies. Um, Edmonton's not close, though. <laughs> I just want everyone to realize that. Yeah, let's get talking about some Canadian geography. 
the yeah, it's the uh, equivalent of uh, Carolina against Colorado. Yeah, that's how far we are from one another. But you know what? There is a a rivalry that's brewing there with just the fact that we're the two Canadian teams. That's an identity in itself, and so we we go at each other on Twitter a lot. Uh, the the supporters from each group, but. Uh, it's hard to be a rivalry when there's only one side that wins. And we've only won one of the seven games. Uh, Ottawa has only won seven, one of the seven games that they've played. It's also the club we've played the most because of the Canadian Championship. Uh, so it, it's, it's a derby, yes, and the, um, the hyperbole that you're getting from the club about, oh, we really don't like each other, and I think that's a lot of marketing, to be honest with you. But whatever it takes to, to build the hype up is good. And like I said, they're playing this game, not in Edmonton, in Fort McMurray. If Edmonton wasn't north enough for you, they decided, you know what, let's go to a town, a 70,000 people town, 300 miles north of Edmonton, and that's where we're going to play this game. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of odd. <laughs> but do you want a prediction or... Yeah, but before we get to the prediction, can you tell our listeners why are they playing in that town? Well, Edmonton's not drawing well. There's that. Uh, but I think they want to expand the, uh, the fan base. Fort McMurray is, uh, is a town that... What, what the town is there for is to work on the oil sands, to, to get the oil from the ground mm-hmm. out of that quagmire out in Alberta. So you've got a lot of laborers that work in that town, and that's all there is in that town. So they built up this beautiful sports complex called the Shell Center, and it seats something like, if I read correctly, 15,000 people, which is bananas, because like I said, there's 70,000 people in that town. Um, they played a game against San Antonio, the Rowdy, the um, FC Edmonton did, the Eddies, earlier this month, and they drew a 1,000 people. So I think the strategy was like, oh, there's nothing in this town. If we put a soccer match in it, every, the whole town's going to come out for it, and that, that didn't materialize. So I don't know. It, it's maybe a, a, a marketing strategy gone wrong, but we'll see. Now Ottawa's in town, and they like to hate Ottawa out in the west uh, because we are the capital, and they feel uh, disconnected from us. So we'll see. I know you're not an Eddie's um, supporter, but do you think uh, down the line would that ever be their uh, home? No, never. It's it's just not feasible. They have to make it work in Edmonton, or they have to. Calgary might be an option, but they need to make it work in Edmonton. Edmonton is the soccer town in, in the province of Alberta. Okay, so let's get to your score prediction. I'm thinking a one-one draw. And a 1-1 draw is, would be a, yeah, that's my prediction as well. Uh, I don't see a winner in this one, and uh, I, I'm i hoping the Eddies are not the ones to break uh, the 10-game unbeaten streak that the Fury are on. I don't think I'm going to be able to watch this one. I'll be uh, at the Cosmos game because cause that's another Sunday night, uh, yeah. like 5 p.m. start time. So let's get to the Indy 11 against the Silverbacks. Indy 11... As you all know, they drew against the Cosmos, which it really, really sucks. Six six matches and six draws. As a Cosmos supporter, just win the match one time, please. Uh, but the Silverbacks, every time they play, they seem to uh, be happy with a draw and just park the bus, which me, personally, I, I don't see how you can play like that. You ever have any thoughts on that? Um, I think, uh, I mean, I don't see, I've watched a few of their games and I have to agree with that. Uh, they really like to, they really either get up the goal and they park the bus or they tie it and they just seem to really play defensively the whole time. And I mean, I don't see how it could be fun to play like that. And then, or if you, as a professional player would want to play like that, not trying to go out there and get the three points and get the win. Cause they really do sit back and absorb a lot and then only attack sometimes. I mean, sitting back is... Good, but if you uh, hit them on the counter attack, but they have a lot of attacking options with Hans Dennison, 
and these key players in the attacking positions, and they don't seem to hurt their opponent on the counterattack. So, on Wednesday, there is two Wednesday night matches. So, I don't know what One World Sports is going to do there. As we know, One World Sports covers the league, just their Wednesday night soccer matches. In Canada, they did fix their way to stream the matches. Are you have happy about that deal? Absolutely, yeah, for sure. <laughs> we can watch the matches. Yay! So, the problem was you weren't able to see your team going... Here, I mean, like, to say to put the Cosmos, or you weren't able to see any matches? We were able to see the Fury uh, matches. Uh, the Fury streamed on their website. Uh, we were having issues with other matches. We, we didn't have access to, to other matches, but that seems to have uh, been fixed now, which we're very happy about. Thank you, NASL. Yeah. Okay, so the last matchup of the weekend is New York Cosmos against the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. Uh, the Cosmos haven't won a game since June. Uh, not exciting times here in New York. Uh, on the pitch, not so great. And off the pitch, hopefully they draw good on a Sunday. They seem to not draw so great, but hopefully this weekend they get a good attendance. They're playing the Strikers who are on fire right now. They just beat the Tampa Bay Rowdies, as you know, Spencer. Uh... They beat your team, which was pretty crazy. I didn't expect that. Neither did we. Yeah. <laughs> so, can't... how much of that? Uh, how much of that is Thomas Rongen? Like, he seems to have turned that team around really fast. There, he really has. He's created a culture, and then there was even a buzz when he got hired. And he's an amazing guy. He's friendly and everything. I've met him. I've talked to him. Um, he's a very friendly guy. He really, if you watch, they have a uh, like Rowdy's Weekly now, and they. Interview him. He's actually at um the there's a podcast, a one sub uh, podcast, and he goes down there to the Rowdies Den, which they built just for the Rowdies, and uh, they uh, he goes on there and talks to him all the time. He's really created a culture, and it's totally different than last year was, uh, and it was good. It looked everything was good in the spring, but there's a lot of uh, talk now among fans that are like they're kind of you know this is the time they need to see his coaching ability because. I mean, they've gone three losses in a row now, which we haven't experienced this season. And a lot of the these fans that have come this year, I mean, we've averaged attendance, you know, up to close. I don't know what the average is. I think it's almost like 6,000, probably less than that, a little bit less than that is the average. But we've sold out like two games. And uh, and the selling out our stadium is like 7,100. So in the last Saturday, there was 4,500, I'm pretty sure. So he's really drawn fans, and he's gotten the right signings and the players to play the right way, and I mean, I think he's done well and he's turned this whole uh, franchise around. And he has a bow tie. Yeah, I was just, <laughs> just going to touch on that. Do you like his bow tie? I like everything about him. There's nothing. The man's um, hysterical. I mean, I think he's the perfect coach and fit. I mean, even his Twitter, if you, he'll tweet yeah. back to you on Twitter, and his he's very, I mean, for his age, I was very impressed when I followed him. I was like, who's Thomas Rongen? I got on his Twitter, and like he's throughout the season, he's really just had me laughing. And He's crazy. He makes... He's probably the only manager that is actually on Twitter. Yeah, that's very true. For sure. You got to tell Mark Dos Santos to go on Twitter. Yeah, Dos Santos needs to be on Twitter. He has an account, he just doesn't use it. I think um, his brother has one. His... Yeah, Philip, yeah, Philip is on uh, Twitter as well. Maybe we just got to tweet him. Oh, maybe. Yeah. I haven't really tried, <laughs> so maybe that's... You've got to tell him to come on the weekly uh, Google Hangout. Yeah, totally an ASL show. Yeah, come on, sure. Marcus Santos. Yeah. Where you at? <laughs> okay, so if anyone's uh, watching us talk about the NASL, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave it in the chat room or at Twitter, at Total NASL. So uh, do you have any uh, things to say? About the NSL. How do you guys feel about the uh, split season? So let's just um, talk about that because everyone, everyone just hates on the spring season. I mean the split season. Uh, and I forgot who it was, but someone said it's just I think the striker supporters are saying that they're the only ones that hate the split season. I don't know why, uh, but me personally. I like the single table, how you see it across the world in England or in 
Italy. But I feel the split season, some people hate it, but it's actually good for some clubs, the clubs that are struggling. It actually gives you a chance to compete for a title. Uh, in England, if you don't have the resources or if you don't have uh, the money, you can't get it done. But in this league, they give everyone a fair opportunity to win the title. Uh, say you're not getting it done in the spring season, then in that break, you could play some friendlies to get or to f fix what you're doing or uh, buy better players. And then you have the fall season where you have to uh, finish it in the top four. Well, it's interesting because here's my concern with the split season, and it falls right into your lap here because the Cosmos won the spring season. They are now guaranteed a playoff spot. Yeah. And now they're 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 dropping like like flies. Like, do you think it's a there's an emotional uh, psychological effect that happens when you are guaranteed a playoff spot and this regular season that continues, there's not that much to play for? I think the Cosmos, uh, the reason why they're not playing so great, I think it's not the spring season, it's them losing against the Red Bulls in the Open Cup because every time, like last year when the Cosmos lost to the Philadelphia Union, you can see that the team chemistry and everything just wasn't there. They weren't playing in the same. That's why they fell short against the Scorpions, which is not, not nothing the Cosmos want to remember. So I, I just think that's the reason. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's my concern is that if, yeah. a, if a team plays well in the spring season, uh, wins it, then there's little to play for except for home field during the playoffs. Um, I'm not crazy. I'm like you. I like the single table for for – and when I write, I usually – only write about the combined table. I'm not that concerned with winning one season or the other. If you play well throughout, you make the playoffs. So that's what I'm concerned with. Today, the NASL, they released uh, on their site and on Twitter, they compared their model, their split season model, to the rest of the world. Uh, and maybe they wanted to show their supporters that other leagues across the world actually have their yeah. same split season. Yeah, I saw that. That's that's interesting too. And it also dashed any hopes that I had that they would abandon the split season, right? If they're if they're promoting that on their Twitter and they're like gung ho about it, it means they're they're doubling down on the split season, so to speak. So I guess it's here to stay for a while, that's for sure. Let's just talk about expansion and then we'll get out of here. So uh, expansion talk, it hasn't been a lot recently. We had a conversation about the future of the Silverbacks uh, because we know if they don't get an investor by the end of the year, then they will relocate. Uh, Theo, do you think if they relocate, do you think they would go to a Canadian uh, hmm. town or city? That is such a loaded question because there have been rumors uh, floating in Canada for two years now and they've been getting louder and louder about a Canadian league. And some of the investors that were talking about getting an AS NASL team in the past, namely Hamilton, um, have gone quiet about NASL. And I don't know if there is a future for NASL in other Canadian cities if this Canadian league comes into play. So everything's up in the air. We have some uh, journalists here in Canada who believe that they've spoken to their contacts and this Canadian league is, is a go, that they're going to announce it soon with a lot of money backing it and the whole shebang. Who knows? It's all rumors and innuendo at this point. Um, if there's no Canadian league, then yeah, absolutely. There are lots of, of, of cities in Canada that could support an NASL team, as we saw during the Women's World Cup. Yes, yes. Uh, but about this Canadian league, do you think it's going to happen... Uh, in the next couple of months or in years? I can only go by what I've seen. Uh, Dwayne Rollins is uh, leading the way in terms of, of news on this. He's a, if you don't know, he's a blogger here in, in Canada, and he has sources inside the Canadian Soccer Association. And he's been talking about the source feeding him news that it's going to be launched in 2017. Uh, it's 
it's it's the the announcement is imminent. Uh, imminent. It's coming up. That hasn't come to light yet. Uh, he expected it to be done already. So that kind of has gone quiet at this point. So if they do come into play, yeah, I think I think the there's a few things. If you don't mind me going on about this, yeah. there's a few factors that that came into play. I think the FIFA indict indictments and the uh, and the is it Anthony Richardson, the, who was the CEO of NASL, or he was on the board. He yeah. had by the FBI. He had a lot to do with the NASL, and that might have given a fright, sent a cold chill up the people's spine in, like, in Canada who were going to invest in NASL. Because right after those indictments came down is when you started picking up this news all of a sudden again about the Canadian League. Um, so that's one factor. And the other factor is that I think people saw, again, the Women's World Cup is, is what we talk about. We also had the Under-20 World Cup in 20, 2007 which was huge, and the stadiums were sold out. Canada has shown itself to be a soccer country. We know this. This is beyond doubt now. So there's the TSN is uh, our ESPN, if you will, yeah. and there's rumors that they have a large interest and they would actually invest heavily into this league. So, again, it's all rumors, and it's it's there's nothing that's been confirmed yet. If the CSA does make an announcement with a Canadian league, uh, do you know if the Fury would continue in the NASL? Uh, I've spoken to people inside the club, um, and they say that they have had no contact with anyone about a, a Canadian league. So that's, that's as much news as I have on that front. And one more sort of what if, if the league is created, uh, the Canadian League, would you support a team in that league that's local to where you live? Absolutely. I would support any club in, in Ottawa. Okay, so uh, talking about expansion, next year we are going to see Puerto Rico FC and Miami FC. So are you guys excited about these two expansion clubs? Let's start with you, Spencer. Uh, yeah, definitely. You know, uh, it's going to add another team to the Coastal Cup, just like they did this year at Jacksonville. So we'll have four teams that play for our little cup that we have down here. But And Carmelo Anthony buying the Puerto Rico FC, I, I want to see what he can do in Puerto Rico. So that, that, those are two things that really do excite me. And adding new teams, I mean, the more teams, the merrier into the league because, you know, most of these major leagues have close to 30 teams, and we're at, what, 11 right now? So... Yeah. Uh, and Minnesota's leaving, so I mean we need more. So the each expansion that we get, I think, is going to help grow the bl the brand of NESL and help uh, just the brand of soccer even uh, in North America. And I think they need to go more west too in the United States because you know they're really just kind of like Central United States and East. I mean going west could help also. And people have asked Bill Peterson, when are you going to expand to the west? And anyone. You U.S. from the league, it acts like they don't care. Is that it doesn't bother them? Uh, there has been a rule saying that if they don't move west by a certain year, then they're going to lose their D2 status. But it didn't bother them or anyone in the NASL. Let's touch on Miami FC. We all know that David Beckham is trying to big to bring a MLS club there. So, do you think it's uh, sort of weird or uh, it may hurt the Miami FC club if David Beckham does bring in? his MLS club? Um, I don't think it'll hurt. I think it will probably most likely help it uh, because everyone will know that David Beckham, you know, big name, big MLS name. Uh, when you bring the MLS down there, I think they'll have fans of that team, but there's also going to be Miami FC. So if they, you could be fans of both teams. They're in two different leagues, and then you're from Miami. You're going to support both. And I think the big MLS name will bring more fans to what whatever they name the team down there. Uh, but I think it'll help bring more fans to, uh, you know, Miami FC also. One thing I, I just don't understand is that David Beckham, he, he's having trouble getting his stadium, his soccer-specific stadium. Just move with uh, Paolo Maldini. Just join Miami FC in the second division. <laughs> I mean, 
they could build a stadium both shared or something. I mean, it could be done that way or somehow, but you never know. Beckham, if you're watching this, just join Miami FC, please. <laughs> isn't the other thing, like, uh, educate me, the Canadian boy here on Florida geography, but isn't Fort Lauderdale essentially Miami as well? Um, it's it's farther north. It's they they were called uh, like FC my I think they before they used Fort Lauderdale because like we used to be FC Tampa Bay, and uh, they didn't have the rights to it. So it used to be called uh, like I forget what they were called, but um, they consider themselves Miami. They're a little bit north. They're not exactly Miami, um, but you know it's a little bit north. It's 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 close enough to Miami. You could think you're Miami. Okay. Do you think it, it would affect, like, they're putting Miami FC in with close proximity to to Fort Lauderdale and then the Beckham team coming in. Do you think that's that's counterintuitive, what they're doing with uh, with adding Miami FC? I don't think it's counterintuitive because if you think about Fort Lauderdale and Miami FC, I think that would build a great rivalry, at least in my mind, you know, how close they would be. And then those are two major cities, and I mean, there's already a great rival between Fort Lauderdale and, and Tampa Bay Rowdies, and we're not exactly close to each other. It's like a three-hour drive or something down there, so how close they would be, and then being with David Beckham's team, being MLS, I mean, you can't really, it's a different division, and there's no relegation or anything, you know, so I mean, it's a totally different thing, I would think, in my eyes. Like, if I'm from Miami, I would support Miami FC, if I, especially if, they, if there was an MLS team, like this Mutiny were still around, I would support the Mutiny and the Tampa Bay Rowdies still because they're two different leagues. I think it, I think all that's going to help each other down there. Yeah, it's a uh, it's similar for me. I support the Fury, but I also drive down quite a lot to go see the Impact. So it doesn't affect my consumption of soccer. I am uh, a sliver of the population, though. I'm I realize that that not everybody likes to go to every game, but um, it's definitely doable. That just touch on one last thing. I know we're talking about too much topics, but it's all good. Uh, there has been some chatter, some conversations talking about could the NASL implement promotion and relegation into their own league instead of USSF just implementing it into the whole soccer pyramid. Uh, so what do you guys think about that? Well, it's with what teams, I mean... We were just talking about how great it is to get two more teams next year yeah. to kind of build this league into a league that looks like the other leagues to, to get to more teams. Um, I think there's a lot of markets in the U.S. You're seeing it with USL. There's a lot of markets out there. And, like, are you suggesting relegation with the USL or just NASL no. so much that they would have pro rel? Just eventually say they grow to 20 say, 30 teams, right? right. Like you just create two divisions, so say NASL and then NASL 2, or w whatever you want to call that league, that second division, uh, where if you're the bottom three at the bottom of the first division NASL, you go down to the second division. I don't know. I think you run into this, the, the same problem that MLS is running into with the talk of, of uh, Pro Rel, because... You look at the Ottawa Fury, they paid into the league, right? They, they bought a franchise. Huh. And what do you say to a team like Ottawa Fury that, let's say, I don't know how much it was, let's say it's $15 million. I know it wasn't that, but whatever. What do you say to a team like that that invested in the league and then finished last and they're bumped down into the second division? It's a tough sell, and I would love to see it. I'm a huge fan of pro rel. I just I, I'm realistic about the challenges of the system that's been built in North America with franchises instead of clubs. And when you've, as an owner, paid into that, you don't want to be bumped down a division uh, just because your team didn't play well one year. Uh, but I would love to see it. And and that's that's a good. I've never even thought of the the proposition you just put together of eventually the NSL getting big enough to to be able to split into a top and lower division. That's cool. Yeah, I like that. I don't know if the Soccer Federation, if they would agree to that, if they would let it happen. Hopefully they do, uh, because Bill Peterson and a lot of people in the league have been talking about that. Yeah. So, Spencer, what are your thoughts on uh, maybe this 
Crowell in the NASL? Well, I mean, I'm always for re- you know regulation and all that. I always I think that's you know across if you look across the world, that's how it's done and it's successful and everything. But even in America and everything, like you're saying, especially with soccer, you know, now it's really growing popularity. You know, it wasn't as popular before, and teams have gone bankrupt before, even the MLS and all that. So I think it is a problem with bigger, you know, whatever if a team were to buy into it, even if it's just NASL, and they were to spend all the money and then do get right, uh, you know, sent down to the other division, um, even if I think the problem would be with the fans. I don't know if there's enough support yet for if you were there supporting your, I mean, I know I would be, but, you know, there's all these, you know, fair weather fans, you know, or new fans, and if the team you're supporting is in the top division, you know, and they get sent down, are you still going to go? Like, because, you know, they're not the premier league, you know, the, you, the, the level of talent, all that's not going to be there because they think it's the bottom division. So even with that, I mean, I think it, there's it's all help because I think competition is going to go up because even with the two seasons, if they kept that, you know, uh, I don't know how, you know, like the one team would automatically bid it in for, you know, the championship, you know, but the, you have to play hard, I would think, because if you go down, I mean, theoretically you could win the spring season and, you know, suck it up in the fall season and fall way down the bottom of the table, but you still get rele- you know, regulated, uh, relegated even though you won the spring season. You know, They'd have to work it all out, but I think it's good for the league if they were to do that eventually get big enough. Yeah. Hopefully if they do uh, implement this two divisions in the NASL, hopefully they do go with a single table. Definitely, I agree. They'd have to go single table, I would think. If you have that, it'd have to be single table. Yeah, I agree. And all the supporters would love it, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just say we're putting a single table in the NASL. Everyone would go excited. Yeah. My, my big issue with this, the spring season is the name spring season. Because people associate spring season with spring training, which is the exhibition season, right? There's a lot of people in Ottawa who thought that the true NESL season started in July because of the name spring season. It's uh, I'd like to see a different name. If they're going to keep the split season, just find a different name for it for the two, uh, the two seasons. Just for that reason. It just, it's too much like spring training in baseball. Well, some clubs do take it as a spring training. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. yeah. No. So, what is your two names if you were Bill Peterson? Oh, wow. I haven't really sat down to think about that. Okay. We'll give you time. <laughs> no, no, I meant like our next show if we haven't. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For a yeah. future show, I'll come up with the marketing plan for NESL. Yeah. Gotcha. So, next time we're gonna talk some marketing uh, for you guys out there. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to tune out here. So give a follow to Spencer at, and so let's just say your uh, Twitter names right now. Uh, at Spencer to Raw. And you, Theo? Uh, I'm at Mimglo, M-I-M-G-L-O-W. Okay, so give them all a follow. They do write for Total NASL. You may see their previews this weekend. Uh, so it's going to be an exciting weekend. You can follow us at Total NASL on Twitter, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel because we try to provide daily content. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and thank you, Spencer, and, I mean, thank you, Spencer and Dio, for, for coming on. It was awesome. Looking forward to the thank next you. one.